So let me take a quick pause here from this episode. Before we dive into today's episode, here's a transformative opportunity that you do not want to miss. Guess what's back? You guessed it? Yes! Our five-day detox the mind program. This think of this like a boot camp. From feeling self-critical to radiating self-confidence. Empower yourself in just five days. No more clouded thoughts or second guessing. It's time to unlock your unstoppable you. What a great way to end this year. So what can you expect from these five days together? Proven techniques to silence your inner critic, powerful mindfulness practices to refresh your mindset, and of course, all of my expert research-based insights to reawaken your self-belief. All of this tailor-made for high-achieving women who are ready to level up. Best, best thing is the price. It's $97. For what? Five hours of my time. So I think with the exception of one day, this time around, we're there at noon, Monday to Friday for a full hour where I'll teach you. And guess what? I'll coach you. You have a chance to ask me questions. We keep it somewhat uh, of a smaller group so that everybody gets a chance to be coached if you want to. You can also just come in to listen to the teaching and listen to me coach everybody else. So tap into the best version of yourself. Join us now. The, uh, the program will start live October 23rd to October 27th. It will be recorded and you have access to the recording for a week. So when you pay the $97, you have access to it live and the recording for one week. Why only one week? Because I know my people and when you buy something that you have limitless ac ac um, access to, you end up never, ever accessing this information. It happened to me this summer. I gave access to people indefinitely and I went to check and only five of them from like 40 plus had actually gone to review the content. So you get it for one week. You have me live for five hours. You have the chance to be coached by me, ask me questions. If you've ever been wondering uh, what it's like to work with me, this is such a great opportunity to do it at a really low cost. If you are friends with somebody who is working with me currently, ask them for their code. They all have a discount code, which brings the program to $27, a perk for being friends with people I coach. So stay with us. We'll jump right back into this episode shortly. Welcome everybody to episode 2019 of Be the CEO of Your Life. Today, we're gonna to be talking about how to have conversations, difficult conversations with people you love. I also have a previous episode on how to have conversations with difficult people, which I think will really complement from this one or to this one. All right, so how do you have a difficult conversation with somebody you love? It's unavoid unavoidable yet crucial to have hard conversations with those we love, especially with those we love. And I think we, all, we have all been there where, you know, something needs to be said and it needs to be said so that the relationship can be preserved and improved and so that perhaps our needs are met and or behaviors or change. So it's obviously essential to any relationship, personal and or professional. So as you guys are listening to this, you might know what person you love, you, you care about, you need to have this conversation with. And my hope is that it's going to help you as a point of reference to come back to and listen to these um, suggestions I have as to how to have difficult conversations with people you love. But keep in mind that although I'm referring to people you love, it could also be people you care about, like a teammate or somebody close to you, but maybe it's not a love relationship, if you know what I mean. So why, why the importance of this? Because what we what ends up happening when we have a hard or a difficult conversation is that we try and we we tend to avoid it. And the cost of not having the conversations, of avoiding them, is building resentment, misunderstanding, tension, 
that ultimately leads relationships to just feel distant or heavy or annoying. And I know for me personally, when I do, when I avoid having conversations, it becomes it becomes really physically heavy, and I definitely start resenting and I start blaming. That to me is an indicator that I haven't been communicating or I haven't been having perhaps conversations that my brain has told me, oh, that would be too difficult of a conversation to have. And I've noticed the same for my clients when they present to a, in a coaching session an issue with somebody else, whether that's their spouse or a manager or somebody in in their team, and they're very annoyed by the person or they feel they have big, strong emotions towards the person and they are on blaming mode, I've realized then that perhaps there has been some needs that have been unmet through communication. And so when we when we sort of ignore and neglect what what matters to us in the name of I don't want to have a hard conversation. We end up building that resentment that leads definitely to that blame and to feeling misunderstood. Okay, so first thing, when like with any good sense of communication, before you even have the conversation, be- before you even prepare yourself for the conversation, notice or think to yourself, when will this be a good time to have this conversation? When would it be a good time to have this conversation? Recognizing the right time is very important. And it's not just the right time for the other person, which is where most of my clients jump to. Like, oh, I think he's going to be more receptive in the morning. What about you? Especially you. So recognizing when is the right time for you to be emotionally ready. So where you've processed through that resentment, where you've taken ownership of what belongs to you, and when you're ready emotionally to have this conversation without losing a grip on what you want to say, on your emotions, where you know you can be respectful, when you know your emotions are not going to take the best of you. And so the conversation can't be half because you're a crying mess or you got really angry or you got really upset and you can't process your thoughts anymore. So you have to be emotionally ready. And this is when I suggest you go for coaching first and process it for your own self and your own understanding to ensure that you're emotionally ready. Now, emotionally ready does not equal I don't care about this anymore. Obviously, you're having the the hard conversation because it matters, but you want to make sure that your mood is not going to be volatile. You're not going to end up swearing or walking away or, or triggered or, you know, the things that will stop you from having this conversation. So emotionally, emotional readiness is very important about deciding the right time. You also want to look to the environment setting. When, oh, sorry, where would it be a good time to have this conversation? Say you want to talk to your spouse about your sex life. Perhaps a restaurant is not the best place because you will both feel shy, maybe, or or limited by what you want to share. But perhaps in front of the children isn't a great time either, right? So like your environment matters. So think of a place where you will feel safe saying the things that you want to say, allowing the person to have the emotions that they're going to have. I like to think of places where if we need to take a step away, we have the space or we're not like in the car and like you must have the conversation and process right in front of that person. So if I need to just step away to the kitchen, I can come back into the living room. So you you want to establish that, like where is a good place to have this conversation? You guys, it sounds like I'm telling you obvious things, but how often do we stop and think? of all the things that are needed to have a difficult conversation. It is an art and it takes steps to do it properly. So you want to be emotionally ready. That also means in emotional emotional readiness, I feel that I also want to be open to receiving whatever that person may have to say. So am I at that place of emotional readiness where I could hear this person fully? Or am I going to still be in defensive blaming mode? The environment is super important so that it is open and calming and allowing for processing, where you're not going to feel restricted by your surroundings. And then, of course, about the right time, mutual availability. So you're not just checking in with you and your agenda. You want to give that person the time to think about when are they going to be emotionally ready, what environment will be good, and whether or not they have the time in the calendar to do it. So I know for my husband and I, we're very, um, it has to be addressed right away kind of people. And often we miss this step of being like, but when are you ready? So I've gotten into the habit of asking my husband, this is what I want to talk about. I need to know when you have the, the time. And I know I know he knows when I mean that is like the mutual availability for both of us. And then we both look at our calendars and we 
think about what we have before and after. I also don't like having these meetings like, oh, before this other meeting, because because you don't know in what state you're going to be after you don't want to have that other meeting pending and like stopping you from, you know, having this conversation fully. So really take the time to find the right time. And now we're going to get into the how. So the why have important conversations because you want this relationship to be sustainable. And it is important to have hard conversations. And who better than the people we love to have these hard conversations with? The how, the, um, the when. The when is determined by your readiness emotionally the right environment, and that the two of you or the people you're having this conversation with are uh, emotionally ready and have the uh, the space. You cannot judge whether or not somebody has the emotional readiness, and you might actually judge that they don't, that they don't want to hear it. That's fine. Still let them know. Still let them know that you want to have this conversation because you're doing this for you. You, to feel good in this relationship, must have this difficult conversation. Now we're going to jump into the how. There is preparation to having a conversation. Of course, there's going to be preparation to having a difficult conversation. Very important as you get to be, ask yourself if you're emotionally ready. You also want to have the import, like the clarity on your end of what truly matters for you in this conversation. What's really important for you? What are you having this conversation for? What's your purpose? What's your intention? What is it that you want to express? What is it that you want to get out of having this conversation. So when you get clear, you get to realize whether what you want is something that is out of your hands and then bring it back to yourself, aka I want them to apologize. You then know that what you want is to express that you would like an apology. That's as far as you go, right? Like then the person has the the, uh, freedom to choose to apologize or not. And maybe you want to explain why that apology matters to you. What's really important about that. So you want to have some level of preparation to tune into yourself and get really clear on what it is that you want. This is a parenthesis for the ladies in the room. Think of what you want, not what you don't want. So many of you go into those conversations. I don't want you to not listen to me. I don't want you to. And you just go down the path of all the things you do not want. That is already setting yourself up for failure. Think of what you want and be clear on why that matters to you, communicating that. I also suggest in your preparation to have a loose script or bullet points of what of your important points so you don't forget them. Often in these hard conversations, we get carried away by our conversation, by our emotions. And if the other person is saying something else, we get distracted and it's easy to lose focus. I have found it incredibly helpful to have a bullet uh, bullet point ideas of what I want to cover throughout my conversation so that I know. I've honored myself. So that's your preparation. I also suggest that you set the tone. Being calm and composed is important. Choosing a neutral location, if depending on who you're meeting. So setting the tone for what you want. How do you want this to be, to be felt? How can you be calm? What do you need to be composed and calm throughout this conversation? What will remind you to stay calm and composed throughout this conversation? Uh, again, choosing a neutral location goes down into comes back to that environmental setting that is appropriate for this type of conversation. Their ownership and I statements. I think is so important to frame what you're going to say from your experiences and your emotions, avoiding to blame. The moment you place blame in a conversation, that person has no choice but to defend themselves. And then you just go into a match of you did, you that, you did pointing fingers, people just defending themselves. So it's important that you frame it as, this is what I owe. This is what I, oh no, own. This is what I own. This is what belongs to me. For example, if you feel unimportant or if you feel neglected or if you feel uh, not respected, you one way of saying this with ownership and using blame is by saying, you disrespect me. Another way of saying the same thing, but in a way that is easier for the listener to hear you would be, I feel disrespected when I express my emotions and you answer back, I don't care. See the difference between those two? I am now saying how I feel based on what he does or she does. Uh, So super important that you use I statements instead of you do this and you, you bring it back to you. I feel when that happens. I feel unimportant when... And you describe the behavior. I have let you do this so many times at the cost of my own well-being. That was on me, right? Like you can own it 
still stating what really bother you. But please avoid blame. And every time you speak begins with an I statement. Uh, point number four is perhaps the most important one after being prepared and ready and clear what you want to express. And this is the art of active listening. We get so carried away with what we want to say that we become deaf to what the person is saying or, or defensive. And when they talk, we're not actually listening to understand. We're listening to defend ourselves or to respond. The most important part of a conversation any, of any kind, but especially difficult ones, is active listening. Listening without interruption and listening to understand. So really trying to hear the person talk to be like, I want to understand this person versus I want to make sure that they got what I wanted them to get. It just, it blocks you. It blocks you when you are just listening for what you want to and not really listening to what they're saying. And it's important so that when you are in active listening, that you confirm that you're understanding. So what you're trying to tell me is this, what I hear you say is this. I hear you say that you feel unimportant when I walk away or roll my eyes. Got it. As opposed to like, no, but you are important to me. Right? Like you just want to acknowledge and validate what that person is expressing to you. Active listening. So freaking important. And just, just as an exercise, notice right now when you are talking to somebody about anything, but especially difficult things, do you normally listen to understand or listen to defend yourself or to, or to bring your point forward to win an argument? When both people are in to win an argument, what, who loses is the relationship. So you want the relationship to win, not you or them, the relationship. And that's when active listening really comes through. Another super important part of these difficult conversations, guys, maybe you've never become made aware of this, your body language. 90% of our conversations are nonverbal. 90. So the 10% are your words. 90% is how you present to yourself. So be aware, self-aware. Are you opening your eyes big? Are you sitting down or are you crossing your arms or are you walking pacingly fast? All of your body language gives a form of communication. Since you already know what you want to communicate and you, you already know the tone that you want to have for this conversation, think about what body language will be in alignment with that tone. Nonverbal cues enhance communication or disrupt communication. Also, you can read the other person's body language. You can say, okay, this person is tense. If their arms are crossed right over their belly button, they're protecting themselves. And that's okay at first, but then think to yourself, okay, how can I ease on what I'm saying? How can I make this person feel more at ease, even though we're having a difficult conversation? I personally suggest that you mimic their body language. It's actually very interesting because by mirroring their body language, they, their unconscious will pick up on that and will and will will start uh, changing to see in your body language what they want to feel. So if the person is crossing their arms, you cross your arms. And as they see that on the other side subconsciously, they pick up on that and like, oh, in their subconscious mind, they're like, this person is guarded. I don't want them to be guarded. So they start changing their body language to get into comfort when you mimic their body language. So be aware of your own, but also read the other person's language and try to mimic it. Point number six, maintain respect. I need to tell you how important it is for any difficult conversation to be based on respect. What does respect mean? Most people, for most people, uh, we all have different tolerances of respect or, or, or understanding. But to be clear, no yelling, no name calling. Staying true to the issue at hand. No yelling, no name calling, and staying true to the issue at hand. If the person is telling you you're raising your voice, take that as a cue. Don't call me slow. Don't call me whatever. Take that as a cue. But you yourself try to not do those things. And actually, I would suggest that when you're having this conversation at the beginning, you guys can have like those rules. Okay, there'll be no yelling and no, no name calling. But if that does happen, we're going to say, hey, let's be respectful. And that'll be our cue. Staying true to the issue at hand saves you headaches. What are we talking about? How can we stay on what it is? That's a way of respecting the conversation that you're having. Point number seven, finding common ground. Ground. This is very important so that you both know that you're on the same team. We both want this relationship to work better, right? Yes? Okay, good. So it's important to have difficult conversations, right? Good. Are we the people who have difficult conversations because we care? Yes, we are. Okay, good. Do we both want to resolve X? Yes? Okay. So this conversation is important. 
what are both parties looking to achieve? You know, like find that common ground. You already know that common ground. Uh, and finding a win-win if possible. How does everybody win with this conversation? So if the conversation revolves making a decision, one person is voting A, the other person is voting B. By having this conversation, the win-win is that we both get to express ourselves and conclude and have our say as to how we can make this A, B work out. Or if it's only A, right? Like always look for the win-win. Um, I, and I also think that knowing when to take a break is going to be incredibly important. So signs that the conversation is no longer productive, pay attention and just take a break. Agree to return to it later. If one person checked out, if one person needs space, if one person has reached a wall, cannot talk, respect that, understand it's time for a break, but agree to when we're going to have this conversation again. Do we need an hour? Do we need a moment? Do you need to take the rest of the day? Do you need to sleep on it? But when are we going to have this conversation again? And the same for you. It might be you. You got to a place of feeling frustrated and you know this conversation isn't going anywhere. Then say, I need, I need to take a break from this conversation, but how about we finish this later and try and be specific. Uh, additionally to these eight steps that I just shared, I think that you want to have real life scenarios as you are talking. So what are real life scenarios? Like, don't just say you always make me feel disrespected. There are so many rules that we're breaking there, right? Like we're blaming um, and there is vague. You can cite examples. That is super helpful. So if I was having, and this is so important for my me with my husband, for example, he's ADHD. If I give him too vague of an example, it just goes right over his head. Or he's going to say, when? When do I do that? And if I don't have a, an example at hand, that, that conversation is not productive because his brain is going to be looking for that detail. So, and, and I think it's actually a good thing to have some of these scenarios where you can say, remember when we went shopping at the mall, I didn't know what store to go to. And I told you, I don't know what store to go to. And then you lost your mind. You were irritable, whatever, right? Uh, that is what I mean. Those moments. How can you just take a moment and breathe in those moments? Have those examples handy for you, not to prove a point, but to clarify what you're trying to say, if it makes sense. I have helped a lot of my clients through these steps of having difficult conversations because once you begin life coaching in general, there's no way you avoid having difficult conversations. Instead, you just Raise up to the challenge, but you want to be as ready as possible. So you're not looking for facts and evidence that they're always doing the thing, but you want to cite some examples so that your point is even more clear. Clarity is kindness. So think of that. How can I make this as clear as possible? I also like the post-conversation check-ins after the conversation. So how are we doing? Are we making adjustments? What will be some of the actionable steps? What are you agreeing to do right after? Do we need help? Do we need to go to a class? Do we need to ask somebody else? What are some of the steps? What are we agreeing on? Be so clear by the end of your conversation. It's so easy to just end the conversation. I said what I had to say, let's go. But it's especially if behaviors are needed to be changed, so important that you end these conversations like you end the coaching call, which is what are the next logical steps to take and how are we going to stay accountable to that? Who's making adjustments? What do you need from me? Because often when we have a problem with somebody, they have a problem with us. <laughs> so they might say, yeah, I actually yell at you because I feel that you, I don't know, whatever. There's a step before. And so you can say, okay, well, yelling is not acceptable. I can see how this is a response from something I do. So I can be mindful of, you know, this part. Uh, and then maybe reflecting on what you learned and how do you want to improve future conversations? So that is it, my friends. This is how you get to have conversation, difficult conversations with people you love. It, it's not a walk on the park. It requires prepping. It requires letting people know that you're going to have a conversation that is difficult for you to have or that it might be difficult for the relationship to have and yet is worth it. It takes preparation on your end. It takes allowing the person to prepare and it takes commitment to follow the steps, to active listening, to do I statements, to discover your own, what you own, what, what your fails, so to speak, have been. How, what is your part in this? I encourage all of you to embrace difficult yet transformative conversations because they 
truly make a difference in how you feel in that relationship. They've removed resentment. They've removed barriers. Once you have a difficult conversation, you get to think to yourself, huh, we're the people who can really communicate. You get It's a skill, right? We were not taught how to have difficult conversations. So it's a skill that we have to develop. It's okay if you attempt to follow these steps and then miss a few. That's perfect. That's at least you gave a, a go to doing this, having these conversations differently. You've changed the approach because whatever approach you have right now, likely is not working. So use this as a roadmap, as a GPS, as something that you want to follow. These are great steps to follow and give yourself the compassion and the patience and the time to improve. But the more you have difficult conversations, the better you master the steps that are needed. I want to welcome all of you if this spoke to you, to book a free discovery call with me to see perhaps how coaching can help you get to your own self-awareness, work through your own blockages that you might have about speaking up, about having a voice, about befriending communication. Many of us have a lot of limiting beliefs about communication, about whether or not we can communicate. A lot has to do with what we've been taught, what we've seen, but mostly with how we see ourselves. And there is no better way to change the way we see ourselves, to understand how we see ourselves and make changes than a process of self-awareness. And that is exactly what life coaching can do for you. So if you head down to the show notes, you can go to book a discovery call. It's free. It's 15 minutes. We can get to uh, uncover what you want to work on and find a way in which you and I can work together. I hope this was a helpful episode for you. I hope you come back to it multiple times and I truly hope you book a call so I can meet you in person. Thank you and talk to you guys next Monday.